When you're playing a game of chess, every pawn move is a big decision because you're fundamentally changing the structure of the position. In this video, I'm going to give you some examples of how to use pawns correctly in the middle game. When to use them to push and restrict pieces, gain space, and break open a closed position. Okay, we'll start off with this example. A lot of times it's hard to know when to push pawns in a relatively closed position. So in this example, both sides have seven pawns still on the board, so it is considered pretty closed. And the only open file here is the e-file, which actually white is doing a better job of controlling. That will be a source of where we'll be fighting throughout the game, um, but that's not where we're talking about right now because white has made this kind of dubious move, moving the knight to the side of the board. And the problem with this move is that the intention is very clear. White wants to go here and gain a tempo on the queen because the queen will obviously have to move or it will be taken. So if we ignore this threat and we say just play something like this, now suddenly white gets to jump in here and we will either have to move the queen somewhere that will also protect the b-pawn because that's also under attack um, or we can consider taking but the problem is we're first trading off our bishop pair and also we're relinquishing control of the dark squares and so once white is able to get this bishop it's pointing at this very strong open diagonal and we just don't have a piece that can control any of these squares and this can become absolutely decisive for white later in the game. And now this whole positional mess could have been prevented if we had just stopped uh, White's knight from jumping to this square in the first place. So how can we do that? Well, as soon as we see this move, it's obvious what White wants to do. And so we can simply push the B pawn to prevent White from making any forward progress. And now this knight is just on a really bad square. So let's take a look at our next example. It's actually kind of a similar position. The e-file is the one that is open again, and there are still a lot of pawns on the board. The difference is there's been a bit of a raging attack over here on our king side. If we go back further in the game, uh, white sacrificed a bishop uh, in an attempt at a great gift sacrifice. Um, however, the problem is that black still has this bishop that can cover the mating square, and so it didn't quite work out. So this is us defending an unsound sacrifice, which can actually be kind of tricky because all the pieces are going to very quickly converge onto our castled king. So back to this position. In the game, this was a blitz game I played several months ago, and without really thinking, I decided I didn't like this knight here. It was still creating some kinds of threats, and so I decided let's just push it back, get rid of the threat forever, get white's pieces out of my face. The problem, of course, is that white can now play this move, forking the queen and the rook. Now, of course, this is still okay for black because we're going to technically end up getting two pieces for the rook. Um, but there is a way that we didn't have to do this, which is if we did want to push this pawn and kick the knight back, we just need to prevent this move from coming with any kind of sting. And so how can we do that? Well, one way is we're up material, so we might as well try to trade off the queens and just stop any kind of major threats from happening in the first place. So the best move is actually to move our queen up, and now if white ends up trading off the queens, now we can push this pawn, well, after white makes a move, now we can push this pawn, and uh, this move no longer comes with so much sting. We can move the rook, and then eventually bring the bishop back and kick the knight away again, and all is right with the world. Now this might be one of my favorite examples that we'll be looking at today. This is from a classical game that I played in a recent tournament. And as you can see, my queen has infiltrated the black position, preventing black from castling. And there are still undeveloped minor pieces that are gonna make it very difficult for black to castle uh, without a few moves going by. So when the king is trapped in the center of the board, and of course our king is off to the side very safely castled, it's a good time to consider how we can break with pawns down the center because as long as we can trade off pawns in the center files, if the king is still there, that gives our rooks room to come in, it opens up more files for the king to be attacked, and it can be very difficult for our opponent to protect their king. So here we go, f3. This is obviously trying to push for e4. This is going to be the entire point of pushing all these pawns. And of course, black wants to prevent this at all costs. So black moved the bishop out to f5, developing and also trying to put as many defenders on the square as possible. But we don't have to let the bishop hang out there. We can push again, g4, pushing the bishop back. And after a few more, maybe unnecessary defensive moves, um, just holding everything together, I finally put the plan into action and push in the center, e4. Now, even though the king is off to the side now, and that's not entirely the point of breaking up the center anymore, if you look at black's pieces, you'll see that these pawns are slowly inching up the board, gaining space, and restricting the movement of black's pieces. 
This bishop is very bad here, it doesn't really have anywhere to go. e4 is also threatening to push again, e5, forking the queen and the knight, and so black needs to do something about that very quickly. And so the pawns slowly pushing and pushing up the center of the board is creating some real structural and positional problems for black. And because I had so much space in this position, my attacking plans became very simple while Black was just trying to untangle all of their pieces. And so again, going back, this all started because we made note that the king was stuck in the center of the board. And even though the plan kind of changed as we got further into the game because Black got the king out of the center, it was still a good plan because it was creating multiple threats. Even just gaining space and pushing Black's pieces back, making them feel very restricted and preventing Black from enacting any attacking ideas of their own. All right, here's our next example, and let's start by kind of taking stock of the position. So one of the first things I notice about the pawn structure is that White has doubled pawns here, which might become a long-term weakness. If you watched my last middle game video, you will also notice that this is probably one of our worst pieces because it is an undeveloped piece. So one of our potential plans should probably be to get this bishop involved in the rest of the game, get it out onto a more active square. So, of course, this is a pawn play video, so how can we do that? Well, the most natural move, I believe, is to push e5. Now, white is most likely not going to take here because this leaves, again, these two isolated and doubled pawns. This is a pawn island itself, and these pawns cannot be defended. Now, we can take here with the queen, retaining the open file and potentially creating some threats uh, down the e-file. And if white decides to push here and potentially trade off this weakness, we don't have to take, that is something to remember. Just because a trade is offered doesn't mean you have to take it. We can actually push, leave white saddled with this long-term weakness of these doubled pawns and also threaten to kind of start destroying the pawn structure further up the board. Because of course, white can't take because we will win material. And if white just waits around, we can take and leave white with this isolated pawn, which we will become yet another target in the position. And even if white takes with the queen, um, the same thing can happen. We can take and there is that isolated pawn again. Now going all the way back here, white of course did not take this pawn because I think even now it's pretty clear to see that that just leaves white with a whole host of weaknesses. Instead they played rookie one and this is where kind of the second part of this idea comes in and that is to gain more space. So you don't take, you push again, forcing the bishop back and now we have this beautiful pawn chain pointed directly at white's king side and this gives us a clear idea of where our attack is ultimately going to go. Now, in this example, we are the ones that have the doubled pawns on the B file, and this can come out of a variety of openings, and in this case, it came because both players put their queens on B3 and B6 and uh, traded them off, and now, because black captured with the pawn, black has these doubled pawns on this file. So a lot of times in these kinds of positions, the best idea is to start attempting to trade off this weakness as quickly as possible and open up the position, also moving the base of white's pawn chain down a little bit further towards our side of the board so it's a little bit more accessible and easy to target. Now let's see how this plays out. So b4. Now if white takes, we of course can take with the knight and this is getting very dangerous for white. The knight is very quickly jumping into the position, threatening all kinds of forks, and so white most likely is not going to want to allow this. In the game, white did not take, but moved the knight back, trying to reroute it over here on the king's side. And so I took, took, and now we're pushing the next b-pawn, hoping to break down the base of the pawn chain even further. Notice um, where the start of the pawn chain was previously on b2, it's now moved up to c3, so it makes that a little bit more accessible for us. Now white attempted to stop the further pushing of this b-pawn with the move a3, but the problem is this actually does not defend against this pawn push at all because after we push, white can take, and now we can actually take with the knight. And of course, it's pretty clear to see if white takes this knight, we actually end up winning the rook because there's not a rook on the back rank to defend it. So a few more moves were played and we got to this position. Now, another thing that this whole pawn breaking open thing has done is that it has given black a passed pawn. And the problem for white is that this pass pawn is actually only three squares away from promotion. So in the game, because I was confident that I had enough control over this file and the eventual um, promotion squares, I decided to push the passed pawn. And this again is actually kind of a major problem for white. And this very simple looking pawn push actually caused so many problems for white that 
they ended up going down a piece and uh, the game was pretty decisive not long after. So let's take a look at our final example. This is probably one of the most fun. If you manage to get this kind of technique in a game, uh, they often turn very messy very quickly and they can be very sharp kinds of games. And that is of course the H-pawn push. Now before we get into that, let's look over here at what black is trying to do on our queen side. It is the queen side even though our king is over here. So with these kinds of aggressive pawn pushes, they can look kind of scary, but often they're not because once you can move the king in and then even if these pawns get all the way down here, what you often want to do is take with one of the pawns and then push the other and black's counterplay over here becomes very difficult and very minimal because everything is just kind of closed off, shut down. So I'm very rarely worried about these kinds of pawn storms in this type of position, especially because all of black's pieces are in the back rank and it will take quite a few moves to get them out and into the game. Of course, a lot of our pieces are also undeveloped, but our attack is simply much faster. The idea is that you want to break down the entire structure around black's king, and because black has chosen to Fianchetto the bishop, it, this g-pawn is just such a juicy invitation uh, for this aggressive h-pawn push, and our bishop is also perfectly placed to prevent black from pushing their own h-pawn and sort of slowing down the white attack. Now, after a few more moves, trading off the bishops, we get this move h5. Now, this is a sacrifice, but it's very clearly an advantageous one for white. Now, black takes with the knight, and in some positions we can even do stuff like this and bring the queen in, um, but this isn't the best in this particular case. The plan here is actually to go g4. So this is pushing the knight back, and now because this pawn is gone, it's opened up for our rook all the way down the h-file, and our queen has the perfect spot to go in, defended by the rook to give this check. And now we can push the knight away once again. We're trying to give a checkmate right here as fast as possible on this h7 square. Now black moves the knight, attempting to shut everything down and hopefully not lose any material. But because this knight is so perfectly placed, we can actually move it up to f4, another piece sacrifice. But of course, if the black knight takes, now this entire file is opened up again and we have our mate here. So in the game, black attempted to create a little escape square here for the king. I took the knight, black took, and now instead of taking this pawn, I actually pushed it forward, threatening another mate over here. And after takes, we take with the queen with check, forcing the king onto the h file, and now the final blow with rook takes pawn. We've used our h pawn to open up all these files, just shred open the castled king's protection and win the game in very quick fashion. I hope these examples helped give you some ideas of when is a good time to push your pawns and use pawn play to your advantage in the middle game. This video is a part of my middle game series, so if you have any other middle game concepts you'd like to see in a video, please let me know. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot. I'll see you soon.